Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I'm the Yomia Community Program Coordinator at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. This is the last lecture in our winter lecture series, and it is on uh, not just cultural preservation, but cultural perseverance and how um, not only are we preserving the culture of the past, but we're bringing it forward to the future. With us today, we have Bo Carroll and Miranda Panther, both from THPO. We have Kachi Tiger. He works with the Cherokee Central Schools. We have Tanya Carroll. She works with um, the Youth Leadership Council, uh, Right Path, and some of these other local lord, uh, leadership organizations. And then we have Hope Husky, who works with the uh, Sequoia Fund. And they all have a lot of initiatives that are very beneficial to our people. And um, I'm very excited to have them with us today. So first up, we have uh, Bo Carroll. Uh, Bo, if you would like to proceed. Um, yeah, my name is Bo Carroll. I, I'm the lead archaeologist for the Tribal Historic Preservation Office of the Eastern Band. Um, I think just like a basic thing of what, what TIPOs do is we take over state historic preservation offices, um, the requirements that they have just on tribal lands um, or anything that involves federal funding. So we take over what the state is supposed to do as far as different sites um, and anything related to kind of our tribe. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, like prehistoric caves, uh, prehistoric cave art. Uh, so I go into caves and look for art, but started seeing writing that, that looked like Cherokee syllabary, um, and it actually was, so I started focusing on that. So I'm more, uh, I like to go into caves in Tennessee and look for for uh, cave art or syllabary and then translate that syllabary. Um, from what I found, it has a lot of background, and I mean, I enjoy what I do. Um, I think your thing said you wanted to know my initiatives and goals. I think just just preserving, uh, so preserving culture and what I'm interested in kind of coincides, so, so that's good for me. So I do stuff that I find interesting and, and it's fun to me and then I can preserve culture, so that's what I do. Thanks guys for having me. Hey everybody, my name is Miranda Panther and I'm responsible for the NAGPRA compliance for the Eastern Band TIPO office. Um, NAGPRA stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It was a, red, um, a legislation that was passed in 1990, so it's been about 32 years since it's been in existence. Um, and I've been here at the TIPO for a few years, over a decade. I think it's like I'm going on 13 years here. So um, over time, I've been able to establish quite a few goals and initiatives for the office. Um, and luckily, I work with Bo, and he does... Um, all of the NAGPRA reburials that our office participates in. Um, so sometimes he'll travel, complete the physical transfer of ancestors who are represented by skeletal elements and their belongings, also known as associated or unassociated funerary objects. Um, NAGPRA has a lot of different definitions, so I'll try not to get too legalese on y'all today. Um, but some of the things that we really focus on is trying to get ancestors and funerary objects, sacred objects or objects of cultural patrimony back from institutions, museums, federal agencies, universities and colleges um, all across the U.S. Um, and we focus on the eight southeastern states that Cherokees had their aboriginal territory. So it would be Virginia, West Virginia, both of the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Georgia, and Northern Alabama. So I try to keep um, Bo and some of his other coworkers pretty busy with reburials. Um, a few of the goals and initiatives that I think are important to mention is I would like to get as many ancestors and funerary objects back and reburied um, as possible in my career here at the TIPO. Um, I would like to continue to make progress on getting museums and institutions to remove funerary objects, sacred objects, 
objects of cultural patrimony off display and back to the appropriate tribes. Um, through our work at the TIPO, we ensure that there's a native voice or perspective on interpretation when it comes to exhibits, displays, and signage throughout those eight states. Um, we do a lot of education and public outreach to community members, tribal members, staff, personnel, and students so that others are able to recognize how important cultural resources are um, and that we need to work together to be able to preserve them. Uh, we do rely on the public and people who work at a lot of these institutions to help us complete that goal. Um, and we also wanna make sure that people know uh, indigenous people, tribal communities are still alive and thriving. They're very vital and resilient and they're not ancient relics of like a prehistoric past. Um, I advocate for change in the laws and regulations and policies and procedures at institutions to better reflect tribally sensitive practices, um, more sensitive and person first language, such as instead of calling um, people human remains, you know, we call them ancestors instead. I feel like that really puts a face to the issue. Um, we want to make sure there's cultural input in the management of cultural resources and sites that are significant to the tribe. Uh, and we also really try to engage with the scientific community to make sure that research is being done in a free, informed manner and that tribes are able to give approvals and permissions for any type of research or image use. Kauchi, if you want to continue. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kachi Tiger. I uh, work at Cherokee High School. I'm a Cherokee language uh, teacher there. I've been there for going on, I think, close to seven years um, in the community with, with, uh, with kids every day. Uh, I primarily work with uh, ninth through 12th graders in, in the high school. Um, we have a lot of different initiatives and, and programs that we do at Cherokee Central Schools. We, we see a lot of kids every day come through our classrooms. And um, one of our main goals is uh, to, you know, teach and to cultivate language learners, um, not just students who learn and to recite language lists and words lists, but actually start to kind of cultivate their young minds to start thinking in a Cherokee way to hopefully in the future produce uh, speakers down the road at different levels of fluency. Um, glad to be here with all these other professional people. I see these faces here and these are all people that do lots for our community here on the boundary and and, and Western North Carolina and even as far as Tennessee and all over. I know THPO does a lot, but um, when it boils down to it, I'm just a school teacher. Um, I'm passionate about the language, kind of echoing what Bo said. I'm consider myself fortunate to be able to have a position um, in a school system where I'm able to, uh, you know, work with the language. I myself am a second language uh, learner, um, not a fluent speaker, but I think that's one of the things that grounds me and, and helps me connect with the kids on their level that they can all grow and they can all learn and they can all adapt and change and develop their their speaking ability, um, you know, depending on how much they put into it. So, uh, yeah, we, ha we have programs that we do every year. We have a cultural summer school. Um, that's a real big uh, enjoyment for staff and students. Um, we pull in people, not just that are Cherokee language teachers, but all staff at Cherokee Central Schools and even some volunteers through the community uh, that have been vetted. And um, they work a lot with um, arts and crafts. Uh, they have different sessions and modules that they go through over about a two and a half week span. Uh, any Everything from pottery to teaching basket weaving, um, working with gourds, and also language classes and traditional foods, just to name a few, and traditional games even. Um, so there's a lot that goes on. We have some after school programs. We have some um, Cherokee language lessons for, for staff, uh, for professional development purposes, and also we're looking to hopefully in the future, offer more for community and for parents, uh, you know, for students at Cherokee Central Schools. And um, 
sometimes there, there's so much going on that I don't even know everything that's happening because I'm in the high school and the middle school, they have a lot of events going on and stickball demonstrations and then elementary is doing something with traditional food tastes. And then, and a lot of times I'm just like, man, I wish I knew about that. I would have came down if I had time during my planning, but there, there's a lot going on, not just at Cherokee central schools at new Academy. There's some language classes going on. Um, that new Academy is doing at a uh, Swain high school. Um, you know, so it's just good to see so much, so much happening these days with cultural preservation and, and language initiatives. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. And, uh, appreciate y'all having me here today. Golly, Lee, got to gay down. Hello everyone. My name is Tanya Carroll. I work at the Ray Kinsland Leadership Institute. We house our Cherokee Youth Council program, our youth um, cultural exchange program. We also have a college age program called Jones Bowman Leadership Award Program and an adult program known as the Duke Dunny Right Path Adult Leadership Program. All of these programs are in place to help teach cultural leadership competencies to our enrolled members ages 12 years old and up. And it's an honor for me to be here to be able to speak to everyone today about the work that we do with cultural preservation. It's also an honor, um, like Kachi said, to be on a panel uh, with Bo, Miranda, Kachi, and Hope. I get to work with them, all of them through our programs and through other things in the community. They're doing amazing work. Um, and we're honored to have them help also in our programs as well to share what they do with our enrolled members through cultural preservation. I think one thing that's really important that our programs are able to do is work with people in our community so they not only learn about our history and our culture, but they get the opportunity to practice it, especially in their daily lives. And, and that's what these folks here on this panel are doing. And so I'm really appreciative, appreciative to be um, speaking with them as well. So thank you, Jen, for putting this together. Mwah. Uh, Shia Nagata, I'm Hope Husky. I am the Associate Director at the Sequoia Fund here in Cherokee. The Sequoia Fund is, is a nonprofit organization that the Eastern Band started back in the late 90s to help um, our community members access capital. There's a lot of barriers to doing things like buying a home and starting a business whenever you live in Indian country. And so organizations like Sequoia Fund are certified by the federal government to try to help bridge some of those barriers and make it a little bit easier for our community members to get housing loans. And um, in the case of Sequoia Fund, specifically business loans. So we work to try to build our local economy here in Cherokee. And one of the things that we've been doing for several years is working really closely with our, our Native artists. Um, we really consider the, the artists a very important part of our local economy, but they're also essential to the preservation of our culture. So we want to help them in any way be able to continue to do what they do. And oftentimes that involves being able to make money so that they can um, survive and, and feed their family and, um, and do more of, of their art and uh, try new things and, and get creative. So we have several programs that we've developed, especially for the artists. One of those is our Authentically Cherokee program, which allows them to sell their work online. Sequoia Fund manages that program for them. Uh, we also do things like help them create marketing materials, business cards, um, social media. And then we run a program with Tanya and another community member, an artist, um, Tara um, McCoy called the Kananishi Art Market and Fashion Show, which is really an opportunity for our local artists to get together and meet, network, learn from one another, and then sell their work um, and get hopefully super creative. We like to provide lots of opportunity for the, there for them to do new inventive things. Um, and, and I think that's really sort of our goal at Sequoia Fund and my personal goal is, is just to empower um, our people, specifically our, our business owners, our youth, and um, and our artists to be able to do more um, 
Yeah, I, I'm super excited to be here. It is a great crowd. I don't often get asked to serve on cultural panels. So I'm very excited. Usually I'm on like economic and money panels. So um, thank you, Jen, for thinking of me. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. She. Absolutely. Um, like I said, you know, it's not just about preservation. Preservation isn't necessarily always about the past. It's also about perseverance. And I really like the programs that you guys are doing, bringing it into a contemporary, into the now in a contemporary way. Um, so I do have some topics and questions prepared. Um, the first little bit, it does focus on like THPO and NAGPRA, but if anyone has an opinion or an answer that they would like to give, if they just feel, feel really strongly to answer them, it's not just limited to Bo and Miranda to answer them. Um, Cause some of them, they will cross over. Um, so Bo and Miranda, what is the benefit to us today to preserve these sites and artifacts of the past? So the, <clears throat> I think in my experience, preserving the sites uh, is, is harder to do than preserving the artifacts. Um, the Eastern Band has a limited land base and uh, a lot of the flat land uh, is buildable and the tribe is hurting for buildable land. <clears throat> so sometimes preserving the sites isn't, isn't going to be ideal. Uh, so as an archaeologist, when it's absolutely, you're, you're not going to be able to preserve the site. An archaeologist is going to come through and document it best, best that they can. Um, so, so the idea is in the future, 20 years, somebody can look at your notes and they can kind of recreate what you were seeing. So it's, it's, it's really detailed um, stuff about, about how the site's laid out, what you're finding. Uh, that's so another archaeologist will know what you're looking at. And that, that I mean, that's preservation. Um, that's the best you're going to be able to do to preserve that site. Um, the artifacts, they're going to go back to a lab and they're, they're going to get, uh, you know, washed and cleaned and documented. But those artifacts are going to tell you. The, so a lot of, I hate to say it, but a lot of uh, Cherokee culture has been lost uh, just because people didn't teach it, um, whoever knew it. The people that the few people that did know aren't around anymore to teach anybody else. So, archaeology and those artifacts help fill in these these blank spots that we might have. Um, if, pe if potters have, they want to know how people like traditional Cherokees made made pottery uh, before contact. Archaeologists are good people to ask that question. Um, you know how how did they cook? What did they eat? Um, you know how they made fires. There's there's um, a whole list of things that that you will be able to get from looking at those artifacts so the artifacts um are extremely important but for you to get those answers they're going to have to come from a site by an archaeologist so you can be sure that's that's exactly what what you're looking at um it can't just be something you picked up off the ground it's a, a systematic detailed investigation um so that, I mean, that, that's a, one way that it can benefit us today. Uh, one way that I find in my job, it benefits me is that if I find a lot of, let's say pottery in one area, then that gives me a, a better idea of kind of how populated the area would have been in the past. And that, that helps me make a case as far as, well, maybe you shouldn't build that building here. Maybe we should go back to the blueprints. Maybe we should we should re redraw the building. Um, maybe we should do a more intense investigation. So basically, what I'm looking for in my job, I'm looking for graves. Um, a lot of the stuff is it. Uh, all of the stuff is irreplaceable. So when you dig it up, you're destroying essentially. Um, but when it comes down to it, I'm looking for for burials. I don't want to disturb the burials. They stay in the ground. Um, I'm not going to dig them up. Uh, I've had people ask me, you know, well, call me bone picker and ask me how many people I dug up, stuff like that. So that's kind of the stuff that I run into, but I, but I don't do that. Like that is my main job is to keep people in the ground 
and not have them disturbed. And if that means your multi-million dollar building has to go in a different location, then that's what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think that I'll, I'll think of a whole bunch of other stuff here in a minute that I should have said, but I get to get, I'm getting a little mad. <laughs> Uh, I feel like Bo and I feel really similarly uh, on this topic. Um, cultural resources are non-renewable, similar to fossil fuels. Once they're destroyed or excavated or salvage archaeology like Bo was talking about, um, where the whole site is um, systematically investigated and artifacts are gathered and documented, you know, we're never going to get that back. That That's just something that's going to be gone. So we really need that real life documentation to use it for interpreting Cherokee culture and history. Um, and similarly, we, our top goal, I feel like is to always preserve burials in place so that they're not investigated. The people aren't disturbed. Um, and, you know, we're getting people back to, through NAGPRA to rebury as well. So we always take that very seriously and make it our first priority. Um, I feel like the things that we learn by preserving cultural resources and artifacts um, are any information that can help fill in gaps or help confirm um, or expand upon traditional knowledge that we find at intact uh, archeological sites. Because once it's destroyed or unfortunately looted, you know, we're, we're missing that aspect of traditional or cultural knowledge that we may learn that that hadn't been known before. Or maybe we had a theory about why certain animals or things were being done at these sites that can help confirm uh, those theories. So that way we're able to pass that along to the tribal community. Um, and we learn more about Cherokee history and culture by preserving sites. I also think it's really neat to see a lot of the um, symbology and iconography um, from past sites be used in present day modern artwork or beadwork, basketry, um, clothing, all the types of things that it sounds like Hope and Tanya are involved in. Um, so it's really cool to see that be repeated because that means it still has some kind of life. It still has a lot of meaning to present day people. So I feel like my next question before I segue into NAGPRA, because I have a couple of other questions I think would benefit the audience that kind of stem from that. So I'm going to combine the next two. Um, as tribal members and people with strong ties to this community, does this affect the job? Does it give you a heightened sense of the stewardship that you guys have? Um, and what sort of obstacles do you face? Because I know there's a heightened sense of emotion there because it is a more personal side of it. So in my experience, uh, being a traditional Cherokee person is, it's like a job. It's, it's, it's my job to um, practice certain tradition, do certain ceremonies. Um, that's what Cherokee people are supposed to do. Um, you're supposed to take care of the people that came before you. Um, and I feel that that's one of my main jobs is to look out for those people there's not a lot of people out there that are looking out for these people. And I think that that cultural tie that you're, you're talking about, that it, it just links me to those to those people. And I've had conversations with people. They say, well, you know, I, I got tired of the fight and I quit. Uh, you know, I don't I don't work there anymore, but it's not. It's not like an it's not an employable job. It's like I can't stop doing this it was like it got to a certain point where i was in it and now like I'm, I'm just in it it's like there's not a lot of people to hand it off to i guess um uh, and then i feel like if if we're the the couple people that do do what we do if they're not doing it then then it's not going to get done and like i can't can't allow that to happen like i can't just stop doing what i'm doing it's just 
I'm too far into it now. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember your. I'm trying to answer your questions so I get mad. <laughs> uh, a lot. I mean, like you said, a lot of this stuff is it's personal. Uh, like it's my job, but I carry it home with me, and it's like it it keeps me up at night. Um, and you know, I worry about what I can do. And then, I mean, the, the tools that the tools that we're given as a tribe, they look good on the outside. I mean, we'll get more of this into the night, but it's like, all I can do is go around and smack people's hands. Oh, well, you dug somebody's skull up and you got it laid on back of your truck. Oh, well, you can't do that. Let me smack your hand. You know what I mean? I'm just waiting until somebody says, what are you going to do about it? Like, I can't do anything about it. Like I can stand here and look mean at you. Might throw some medicine on you. Like I did those, uh, the power people that time they had dug that person up. So it's like, I don't really, it's a tough job. Uh, really, it's a really tough job. Uh, the, yeah, I'll wait till we get to the night part for that. But, oh, uh, then I forgot what the question was. <laughs> uh, just sort of talking about some of the obstacles that you guys face. Oh, yeah. and I know that kind of stems into NAGPRA as well. I know um, you guys well, get I mean, pushed back from companies and from townships and yeah. all of that. I know there is a little bit of pushback uh, when we were trying to acquire an Aquasi. Oh, yeah. Um, so I get, I get this. Um, I kind of get it from both sides. So like I said, I've been called bone picker. People kind of look at me when when I tell uh, Cherokee people that don't know who I am, what my profession is. It's kind of uh, like they they take it they take a step back, and it's kind of like well, it's a distrust because I'm an, I mean I'm an anthropologist and anthropo historically anthropologists have come into Cherokee country and they'll, they'll they'll work with Cherokee communities and they'll build their careers and they'll take all the information and they'll, they'll make a career of it and they'll leave and publish all this stuff for these white academics. And I mean, they don't give anything back. They never come back to the reservation. They never give back to the people that actually gave them the information that they built their career on. And like, that was one of the reasons I wanted to do, what I do is because I didn't want it to be that way anymore. But I mean, I also run into that when I'm around other anthropologists or archeologists because they're kind of suspicious of me too, because I'm there like, I mean, I want to say that Cherokee people ain't just going to show up and take all your stuff from you, but sometimes they might. And I want people to be worried about that. Like, I want you to be cognizant that I might just show up and take all your stuff and I'll take it back and put it in the ground because it ain't mine and it's not yours. And you don't have, you know, you, there's no reason you should have that stuff. And I think like I, I get distrust on both sides. Um, so sometimes it's hard for me because it takes a long time, especially with, with Indian people to develop a trust in relationship and for you to be a traditional person and to have the career that I have, it's especially hard for me to develop these relationships and to be around people where they can be free and trust that I'm not going to take the information that they're giving me and exploit it for personal gain. And I want people to understand that that's not what I'm doing at all. And I've had many conversations with people where they've said that it's okay for me to talk about something and I just didn't feel like it was. So I did. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, I guess, both ways, but I also, I get a lot of benefits from being on both sides too. Like I know things that other are, other anthropologists would never, would never know. I know, I know things because I've experienced. Them. So it's like, I, it fills in gaps in my head where it makes my, uh, I guess my research better. My, my research is better than somebody who doesn't have a traditional knowledge mindset i guess so i'll benefit from it too um and it's just it's a, it's a balance like be just being a cherokee person it's just balance it is and sort of to segue off a couple points you made um you know in archaeology and with museums i think it requires people belonging to indigenous populations to come in and protect 
what needs to be protected. And unless you have that perspective, that tribal perspective, you're not really going to fully, they're, they're just never going to really understand why it matters to us the way that it does. I mean, you can't, you can try, but like you said, the anthropologists will come here and they will get this information and they'll just kind of never come back. But then there'll be these big names in academia when that spot should probably belong to an indigenous anthropologist speaking on their tribe in this way. Um, but yeah, so definitely feel that line. So we're going to go into NAGPRA now and kind of want to, <laughs> saw that look, um, kind of want to talk about the good and the bad. Um, I interned with you guys so many years ago, so I kind of got a little look into what you guys are dealing with, but not much of one. Um, heard a couple stories from Miranda. So yeah, like the good and the bad. And uh, here in the chat, we have someone asking about local universities. Um, I'll read the question and then I just want to address something about it myself. Um, how do you differently handle sites that have been professionally and caringly dug, i.e. not looted, such as at Warren Wilson College, UNC Asheville, Western Carolina University, University, et cetera, especially when EBCI does not own the land, are the remains left but objects taken, and were those college sites handled professionally and caringly? And I would just like to address that Um before NAGPRA and probably even after, no, they weren't always handled professionally and caringly. There was a huge one on Western Carolina University's campus that was completely demolished. And it was like a free for all for the articles, the artifacts and remains. Um, I want to say that the remains were ending up in weird little shops in Tennessee for a while and the feds would have to come in and get them. And, uh, I think Western's doing better. They definitely uh, are handling uh, a current archaeological site better from what I saw a couple of years ago, but I'm also not a professional and can't answer that on that as much as uh, Bo and Miranda could. Um, I mean, that's a good question. We definitely, you, you know, expect to and should have a mutually respectful relationship with local universities and ones that aren't close by either but i kind of feel like um it's kind of like friends or family like you expect them to like treat you well versus like a stranger who doesn't know you who may potentially treat you badly so with people who are really close by you know i expect them to do right by us there haven't always been staff or regulations in place to monitor that work being done. Um, there was, uh, to my knowledge, a mound and a village site that was basically blitzed on Western's campus that you mentioned, Jen. And we have photos where they invited community members to come and surface collect in the overturned dirt. Um, and it was like, um, field day like you know it seemed like a very kind of joyful occasion for these people to be able to come in you know they're in skirts and like flats you know it's not like they're wearing field appropriate attire and you know are surface collecting because it, it, there's some fascination with you know artifacts and they feel like it's just a long dead history when when really it's not so you know prior to the passage of the national historic preservation act in 1970 there weren't any tribes weren't owed any type of special treatment when people wanted to build a house or expand a college campus or um build a parking deck or, you know, what have you, any type of expansion or business or home opportunities. Present day, we do have good relationships with people um, who work at Warren Wilson, like Dave Moore and um, 
you know, we have NAGPRA communications with people who work at Western. There's some good people there now. They're not as far along as I would like, but they have been making strides over the past um, decade, few years or so to really involve tribes, you know, in the beginning. Like that's what we want. We want to be like involved in the planning stages because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of money um, and maybe that you wouldn't have needed to, or you're still going to spend all that money and do it in a way that the tribe wouldn't approve of. So they should bring us in as soon as possible. We're subject matter experts. We know, you know, how things should proceed. And, you know, why archaeologists like Bo was talking about don't have that cultural sensitivity knowledge to know um, what to do in certain situations if a burial is encountered. Um, or some other type of structure that maybe was traditional or something that should be off limits. So that's our responsibility um, in that process. But if we're not brought in early or aren't made aware, then, you know, we can't really contribute. Um, and I would say that's one of the obstacles. If there's not a federal hook, you know, if it's not federal property, if it's not a federal agency, if it doesn't involve federal money, um, we can't, they don't have to consult with us. And even in the language and the legislation isn't particularly strong. It says they have to consult with us, but they don't have to do what we say. They just have to meet that consultation requirement. So um, it's really important for us to build rapport and relationships with these people so that we can make them understand why it's so important to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, there are lots of obstacles to that. You know, if it's on private land, we can't do anything. You know, a, a private landowner can dig up an archaeological site on his property um, and potentially traffic or sell artifacts and monetarily benefit from such because it's very hard to prove that it happened prior to a so certain date and it's his property. Um, and those are a lot of people that we don't hear from. Um, and some private landowners are great. You know, they want to preserve it if it's a cave or if it's um, a mound site. But if it doesn't have that federal hook, we we don't have like a, a legal standing in that issue. You said after 1970, I know since I started working that I, instead of making people do what you want, because I found out you can't do that. So it's like, I, I mean, I could ask you to do something and you could either tell me no or yes. So I've found that developing these relationships with these other archaeologists and actually spending time with them and letting them see it from my point of view. I want them to understand why it's so important to me. And I want them to see the benefit of working with tribal people. I want to be able to help you in your research. But why I'm doing that when I'm developing these relationships, I kind of rub off my, my, the way I believe things should go and how, how you should respect certain things. It kind of rubs off on them. And I've become, I mean, essentially friends with these people and they can call me if they have questions. They can ask me, you know, I, I, I'm in this situation. Well, what, what, what do you think I should do? And then it kind of like I'm a, maybe an unofficial go between. So it's like, a lot of those people from those institutions ask me questions like that. They want to know, like, what can we do to do the right thing? Um, it, it goes a long way when, when people do that. But yeah, like Miranda said, those artifacts belong to the landowners. Um, that There's a line, I could stand at this imaginary line at the end of the reservation, and I could say, you can't dig a hole here, but you can dig a hole there. Like, I can't tell you because of this imaginary line. Like... And it's just what you're dealing with. You work with what you're dealing with, I guess. It's a good question, though. Um, I thought of something that I wanted to add um, while Bo was talking to, um, you know, it's it's really tough. I, I have cried at work before <laughs> on a NAGPRA related issue. And, you know, I'm not proud of that, but I'm not ashamed either because we are really passionate about it. And some NAGPRA projects go on for years, five years or more. It's such a slow process. 
And when you get to the end um, and something kind of goes wrong, you're just like, oh my gosh, that was five years of my life and numerous emails and phone calls, uh, just a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and Bo and Joha helped me a lot. Sometimes I have, you know, traditional questions that I need to um, find out answers to. You know, I don't pass that information along, but I'm able to answer in kind of a vague way to be like, no, we don't want to do that. Or yes, you know, we do want to do that. But we really just try to make people understand that it's a human rights issue. Um, and I'm not a tribal member. Uh, I grew up on Boundary in the Yellow Hill community, so I don't proclaim to be um, enrolled or a tribal member. Um, but I feel very passionately about this kind of work. Most people don't even know what we do. It's not a job that we advertise or for glory or fame. I definitely don't tell people I work with dead people because that would trip them out, like Bo was saying. Um, but it's just at the core, I feel like, of everybody that we, anybody that we are, it's like people understand that. And graves are just a sacred um, and special thing. You know, that's why we have funerals to this day. You know, that obviously means that this is a practice that we've carried forward for thousands of years. It doesn't lack in value for all the amount of time that's passed by. I don't think there's any shame in having cried with some of the things that you guys deal with. Like I said, you know, this is a being as part of the community as everyone here is, it definitely gets personal, um, especially when you're dealing with these people who far back are like our family. They are, they're our family members. They're our ancestors. Um, it definitely, you know, gets personal and we can all see that and appreciate it. Um, but that's so I'm going to move on to Kachi and I suppose Tanya too because you both work with our youth and part of you know preservation is bringing it forward um you know Kachi you said earlier that you were just a school teacher you're not I don't think you're just a school teacher especially considering the subject matter that you're working with it's very important um and we're definitely seeing a sort of a, a renaissance now where there is this huge push culturally to broaden and try, or we'll try to touch more people within our tribal communities nationwide to inspire them to learn the language and learn the arts and learn who they are truly. Um, so yeah. Uh, But um, where's my questions? <laughs> I have some written down. I have some in front of me. Um, so yeah, you know, Kachi, you mentioned earlier the uh, cultural summer camp, and uh, my son participated in both the cultural summer camp a few years ago, and then the traditional dance after school program. I think those are some really cool initiatives. Can you talk a little more briefly, maybe, or more a little in depth, not briefly? on some of the other programs that the school is doing. Um, sure, yeah, the, um, that, that's kind of what I had said earlier, that there's so much that goes on a lot of times. It's been going on for so long and so many years, I just kind of forget about it. And I used to work with the traditional dance group for a couple years, and then we were able to hire some more staff on and some more people at the elementary, um, you know, took over with that. But, um, I think our goal, and I have to pay homage to uh, Miss Laura Penix, who's been there uh, in Cherokee Central School Systems for, I believe, close to three decades. And she was uh, the one that, you know, kind of got the language program and Cherokee history classes there off the ground. And, and she's our, our manager and faithful leader. Um, and of course, was fortunate for her to bring me on board to help out. But, um, I agree with you about the resurgence or <clears throat> more people, I guess, taken to the language. I don't think that there was ever a gap in people wanting to learn, but I just see it as now as somewhat of a, a language renaissance. And I know people that know traditional uh, Cherokee prophecies and whatnot, 
they speak of things of, of coming back and returning back to old ways um, and language reemerging because people often forget that, um, I shouldn't say people forget, but oftentimes we need reminding of what our people have gone through, um, what was done to our people and where we are now. I don't like to play the victim or harp, <clears throat> harp on what um, has happened in the past, but it's important to know that so that when you move forward, not that the quote unquote make the same mistakes again, but really, really kind of cherish what we have. And and I don't like to necessarily use the words of preservation as much, but I don't want to just preserve what we have. I want to grow what we have. I want us to thrive once again, like we once did. And a language is all encompassing um, with our crafts, with our foods, with our ceremonies with everything. It's who we are. Um, it's just about being Cherokee. And just like some of these other people on this panel have said, if you really feel your Cherokee in your heart, or you really want to be a part of the community, I kind of just ask myself the question. I ask my kids this all the time. What are you doing to not necessarily show that, but what are you doing to honor your ancestors, the ones that were here before you? And one thing you can do, um, instead of talking from the perspective of a victim that our language was taken, our culture has been taken. People have literally been taken from their homes at small ages. What are you doing to combat that? We know those things now, and especially those of us that study history. Um, but it starts with the kids. And at the same time, we can't too put, put too much pressure on our young ones um, because I know there's a lot of initiatives out there to, to promote language growth from, you know, in utero to adulthood. And it's important to start kids young in anything that you want them to learn. But it's not necessarily from a perspective of a, of a school classroom, in my opinion. Um, I agree with Bo again, what he said about you have to live it. And I just feel fortunate enough, one, to be blessed uh, to be a Cherokee, a person. And then understanding what we should do to care for our culture, our people, our landscapes, and the ones that came before us. And then when we're in the dirt, the ones that come after us. And that's, you know, should be our legacy moving forward. Um, but, you know, with the kids, um, they present something new every day. They keep you on your toes. Um, and when I said that I'm just a school teacher, I kind of say that somewhat sarcastically because anyone that knows anything who's worked in the classroom or if you remember anything about that, a uh, teacher that had an impact on you, even if it was only one through your schooling, that there's a lot that goes into school uh, to being a teacher. And you're not just a teacher, you know, you're um, you're doing a lot of things that you may not necessarily be uh, specifically qualified to. You're a dating expert. You're, uh, you know, just life in general. You try to guide these these uh, young people in the right way, because, you know, we speaking from personal perspective, you know, you make mistakes when you're young, but hopefully when you get older, those uh, mistakes help form you into who you are. And you kind of, I feel that kids that grow up with their culture, kids that grow up with their language, um, when they get older, especially with the age group that I work with, they don't necessarily struggle with that identity crisis that so many, so many of our youth go to. And that often leads down a, down a bad road. Um, it can. So I, I just feel empowering our people and, showing them to be proud of who they are and what they have. And even if they don't feel connected, it's in their DNA. I tell our students, if you're Cherokee, you know, your blood is in these mountains, in this ground, you are your landscape. Um, and it's, and it's also your duty to know that and understand it and to uh, contribute to it. Don't just be a, a spectator because we're very fortunate to have a lot of the programs in uh, casino revenue that our tribe does with and we're provided with health care education and a lot of different tribal programs but i feel that it's it's important for not just to focus just on language but that these kids understand that not all tribes are fortunate to have what we have and we have a lot and we have a lot of great things going on but i also encourage everyone to try to always improve what we have just to make it better for the next ones who come after us um i know i got a little off topic there about school programs specifically but uh, we also have in the high school arts and crafts where they teach. Uh, we have Miss Lori Reed. She's a excellent uh, 
person to teach that class. She has, she's just grown up in it. Um, basket making, teach basket uh, uh, weaving and basket making, I guess on, on another level. Um, we had wood, wood carving as well. That's taught by Mr. Josh Adams, who's a well-renowned uh, Cherokee wood carver, mask and sculptures and different mediums that he works on. Um, and of course we have our language program there that I feel is very strong um, and it's been there for a while. It's been a, a staple in our community, but it, I feel too, it needs to continue to grow and, um, and adapt for our people moving forward. Tanya, I'll, I'll be quiet now and you can. <laughs> so, um, I work with our Cherokee Youth Council program and our Jones Bowman program. They're college age students, but they're, you know, a lot of them are under 25 years old and, and so they're they're still youthful. Now that I'm in my thirties, I can say that your twins are still youthful. <laughs> but um, you know, just kind of echoing, I think the conversation has gone towards, you know, preservation through landscape or physical places. And through our programs, that's what we strive to do um, is to, you know, get our get our youth members out of a classroom setting and, and try to do more experience based education with them and being able to take them to these physical locations that Miranda and Bo work so hard to preserve and protect is such a powerful experience for them. And it's also, I think, really strengthens the identity they have um, as Cherokee people still being in our original homeland. And if it wasn't for, you know, the work that THPO, the work that other people in our community are doing to preserve our culture, you know, we wouldn't have these examples and these experiences to be able to share with the people that are in our programs. And another thing I want to say is, so we have some of Kachi's students in our programs. And just so he knows, I don't know that they tell him this, but they really appreciate the work that he's doing with them in his classroom. We do an exercise with them um, where they write thank you cards to express their appreciation to people that have helped them. And he's probably the top card getter from that exercise. Um, they really do appreciate not just the Cherokee language that he's teaching them, but him being a role model and him being able to not just share language, but other aspects of our culture with them. And for them to have that kind of example um, to, to somebody to look up to and, and see that it's possible to be rooted in traditions and to be rooted in culture and also just, you know, be a regular modern Cherokee um, is really important, I think, for our youth to be able to see that. And, and that's just the work we do in our program. So we um, we have seven core values that we focus all of our programming around that the community developed um, probably about 15 years ago. And so we utilize those to teach arts and crafts, to have Kachi comes in and talks about identity, um, just to really strengthen them and empower them to find their voice as a Cherokee person and to be able to be rooted in the community and in that culture. All right. Tanya, can you um, also talk about Right Path? And um, I had read somewhere you'd given a presentation on decolonization. And could you address why that is important and um, how it could be beneficial in uh, revitalization of culture? Sure. So our Right Path program, which is the Duke Dunn Adult Leadership Program, it is for enrolled members that are 18 years and older. And for the most part, we get people that are in their careers. And so they're, you know, full time employees in our community that it's a nomination program. So other people notice that they have leadership skills, that they're interested in learning more about the history and culture. They get nominated to be in the program. Um, actually, Kachi and Hope are members of the program that we utilize, and they also come back and serve as presenters. Be, but um, So that program, we 
since they're adults, we're able to talk a little bit more frank and direct with them about some of the, the topics. And so last month or two months ago, I gave a just an introduction presentation on decolonization and ways that they personally could work towards, you know, decolonizing their everyday lives. And I learned about decolonization from a conference that I was able to attend in New Zealand. And it was really the first time that I had heard of it. And I know it can go by other names as well, but basically it's, you know, it's not going back in time and trying to live like we did pre-contact, right? I mean, that's pretty, I think we could all agree that would be pretty impossible right now. But um, it's really just to take things in your everyday life and try to turn them into a more Cherokee way of thinking and being. And the number one way to do that is to speak your language. And so I really try to emphasize how important that is because, you know, using it to be able to express yourself, that's our way of telling the world our views and who we are as Cherokee people. And I think that, you know, being able to do that is not only empowering, but it also brings you back to, you know, who you are at your core as a Cherokee person. And so that's one thing that they focus on. And then we also talk about, you know, being able to garden and gather wild foods in a traditional way. And so really it's just to try to take how you live your life and, and make it more Cherokee. Um, to take out, you know, the colonial oppression and westernized way of living and just try to to be more Cherokee in your daily life. Um, I, I hope was in the presentation. She might be able to say if it was useful or helpful at all. But um, I think it's a buzzword now, you know, that a lot of people hear. I see a lot of memes about it on social media. And so I think addressing it in our program in a way that it can be practiced and understood um, and be useful is helpful, you know, when people are looking at how they deal with relationships and situations at work, um, when they're thinking about, you know, understanding the historical trauma and how to deal with that, you know, as a supervisor or, you know, um, as a teacher or whatever their career is. Yes, let's see. Could you also talk about the uh, youth cultural exchange? I know, I, is that the trip where they go to Costa Rica or to other countries? I participated in that when I was in high school and uh, part of uh, the stipulation was we had to bring something cultural, like a story or an item and uh, exchange it with a tribe in Costa Rica. I'm not sure if you, like, is that still a stipulation? It is. So um, I work with uh, Levi West. He's the program coordinator over the youth council and also the cultural exchange program. But we advertise and select 10 regional youth. Um, the majority of those are enrolled members, but it's not, you know, a requirement. We have classes with them um, for about eight months, preparing them up to the trip, and then we, we take them on a cultural exchange to Costa Rica. This is actually the first time that I've been working with a program. It's been dormant for several years, and so we were able to get the funding and bring that back. What's up with my lighting? Sorry. <laughs> This sun's coming in the window now. But, um, and so as part of the requirement, they, um, the trip is funded through a grant from Cherokee Preservation Foundation. And so the classes are really kind of their way to pay for the trip. And so they learn about Cherokee social dances. They learn about, they learn Cherokee language. They learn, you know, some Spanish to where when they get down there, they're able to share parts of our culture with the indigenous people of Costa Rica and then learn some of their culture and traditions while they're there. It's a pretty amazing program. It also has um, a component where they visit Earth University and they learn about land stewardship, um, better ways of taking care of the environment, uh, recycling and things like that. 
in hopes that when they come back home, they're able to share that with the community and try to spark some, some projects like that here at home. And travel is a wonderful experience. It's a, it's a great learning and educational opportunity, um, not only for them, but, you know, as adults, it's awesome and a great experience, learning experience too. Yeah, it was definitely an experience that left um, memories, you know, like that I still cherish today. So it's definitely something beneficial that I think they'll always carry with them. I'm glad you guys were able to bring that back. Um, are you guys going to keep it to Costa Rica or is it open to anywhere? Right now, I think we're talking about doing every other year, probably Costa Rica or somewhere similar. And then the other years doing a domestic exchange with a tribe in the U.S. Uh, we were doing that for a couple of years. And, you know, the youth really benefited from being able to go and visit other tribes here because you know we're so secluded being the only federally recognized tribe in north carolina that they don't get a lot of interaction with other tribes um aside from you know like sports tournaments and things like that so being able to go and do a cultural exchange with a domestic tribe is something that we're trying to do as well yeah okay so all right so we're coming we've been going for an hour. I'm going to um, go to Hope now, and I want to talk about some of the initiatives that Hope's doing as well. She, um, uh, through Sequoia Fund, she's initiated Authentically Cherokee. They have a fashion show that they do uh, where they will design culturally relevant and contemporary pieces. The uh, the art market where they build up local artists and not just local. I think last, uh, this past year, you guys opened it up nationwide, didn't you? We mostly just keep it local. Yeah. For the most part, it, it, it highlights EBCI artists. We would love to one day maybe have a, a multi-tribal art market. Um, but yeah, right now, um, those programs are something that Tanya and Tara, and then we partner with another um, partner is Jay Winchester at Cherokee Central Schools um, that we kind of do. It's kind of part of our jobs, but also something we volunteer and do. Um, so it's growing, uh, but we're going to have to find more partners to grow it that big. So if anyone's interested yeah. in helping plan a fashion show, never let us know. Well, um, I volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a lot of fun. It really is. It's, um, yeah, I, I'm super fortunate in the job that I have because I get to work a lot with creative people and, and do fun and exciting things. And um, if she's not here, but I keep mentioning her. But, if you know, Tara McCoy, she's always bringing you good ideas of things to do. And, um, yeah, she, she's a good person to know and, and be able to be affiliated with because um, she has great ones. She is watching, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so could you uh, talk a little more about Authentically Cherokee? I know that's been uh, going for a few years now. Um, you know, I know you have like a, um, a couple of branded things through that, but it focuses on promoting Authentically Cherokee artists, correct? Yeah. So one of the things that happened, we held a business training back in like 2012 and all artists showed up and, and it wasn't planned that way. But when that happened, it sort of clicked in our minds that while the artist community is really interested in building their business skills and they want to grow. And so from that training, we invited them all to, we called it like a networking session at the local coffee shop. And we just asked them, what do you guys want? Um, for us, it's really important in the programming we provide for it to be something that the community members are asking for, not necessarily what we want to give them. Um, so the things that came out of that were, we want access to markets, specifically online markets. We want something that we can show people that says, hey, we're enrolled members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And if 
someone can't show you this seal or this certification, then you may want to watch out if you're buying artwork from them. It may not be made by a member of our tribe. Um, and then they wanted opportunities to get together and, and not even just sell, but just kind of talk and learn from each other. So, so that's how the Authentically Cherokee program sort of developed. We created a, a seal for them that uh, we literally named it Authentically Cherokee because they wanted something to authenticate their work in some way. And it doesn't mean um, anything as far as as the work being traditionally made or handmade. In fact, a lot of our early artists who participated were very contemporary artists. They were doing um, work with laser engravers and making soap and um, things that you wouldn't consider traditional Cherokee arts and crafts. Um, but it does say that this was made by an enrolled member of the Eastern Band, which is important for consumers to be able to be made aware of and, and what that means. And, um, and with that, we help the artists create bios so that they can tell their story a little better. It's hard to tell your story um, face to face to someone, but online it gets even harder. So how do we sell a piece of work that uh, is so much a part of ourselves and our community if people don't know us and don't meet us and don't understand and maybe have never even visited Cherokee? So we really tried hard to to work with the storytelling aspect of it. Um, any artist who's enrolled can take advantage of the program. You can sell online. It is, um, it's sort of artist ran. You get your price for the goods. We take a small um, commission to keep the site running and we write grants to pay for it. Um, Cherokee Preservation Foundation also funds a lot of our programs as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's been a, a fairly good program. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Um, the website, definitely authenticallycherokee.com. You guys can visit if you're interested. We we hold all the items here in, in our office. So if you buy something, um, it ships out from here. But periodically, we'll do packaging and shipping classes with the artists to teach them those skill sets as well. And anytime an artist wants to take something off the site to maybe sell at a weekend market, they can. Um, and, and that's another thing. So we do, because we have that online presence and my emails associated with it, we do get calls occasionally from folks who are looking for specific pieces, uh, museums who are interested in, in buying something for their permanent collection. And then we can connect them to the artist in the mediums that they're, they're interested in. Um, it also allows us to be able to represent artists as a collective in other locations. So um, there's a great opportunity that I'll plug coming up in Chattanooga, if anyone will be around uh, the first weekend in April. And there will be several EBCI artists there, but Authentically Cherokee will have a table as well to represent some of the artists who can't make it. Um, so, so we try to do different things like that, have both online and in-person sales opportunities for artists. Go ahead. Just real quick, I wanted to give a shout out to Tara too. Not only do we work with her on these things, but she's over the Right Path Adult Leadership Program as well and does a fantastic job with that. And that's just something, you know, for people working in the fields that we do, you can't do it by yourself. Like we all know each other. We have to build these partnerships with each other in order to make, you know, this preservation. Um, successful because you can't really do it alone. So I just wanted to throw that. Um, I wanted to add something too that we try to do here at the TIPO. Um, and I just saw a question about our archaeological symposium. Every year we purchase swag to give away at our symposium from Cherokee artisans. We want to make sure and provide them opportunities to, um, you know, people from all over the country come to our symposium. And so they're able to see this individual's artwork. And so that might encourage future sales uh, for, for people. So we definitely try to feature a couple of people every year. And we also get a lot of projects where um, federal agencies want to um, interpret or kind of redo um, different sites 
um, especially in Chattanooga and a lot of places in East Tennessee. And so we always recommend that they work with Cherokee artists from the tribe here. So that way it provides opportunity for them to make some money and make some connections because that could potentially be a lucrative um, way to make money is by working with federal agencies and um, they typically have enough money to pay different artisans. We want to get the beauty and ingenuity of Cherokee artwork out there. So we always push really hard to try to involve people who are enrolled and are, are doing amazing artwork or different types of crafts here. How, and this could be a question for everyone. It's still centered towards, um, the art market, the fashion show, and artists in general. How do you think the tribe could better support uh, local artists um, in the arts economy within our community? I'll give it a try. I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to leave things out that the artists will be upset that I didn't say. Um, I think that there's several ways. Um, one is is locations to sell. Um, I, I don't want to um, seem negative on any efforts that are made, but it's really hard for artists to sell outdoors. Um, having indoor space is, would be very nice, um, especially indoor space that you could lock up and leave your things there. Uh, when I think about our artists having to make stuff all day and then pack it into their car, take it somewhere, set it up, um, sell for a few hours, then pack it all back up and take it back home for the next day. That's a that's a lot of work. Um, and, and that's a hard business model to sustain. So um, indoor locations would be great, I think, for them. Um, and also marketing. Um, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about what Native art looks like, especially Cherokee art. And, um, you know, we get lots of calls. Hey, can you can you hit me up with an artist who makes stream catchers? And, and that's great. But that that's not typically a Cherokee, an Eastern Band of Cherokee art form. And our pottery looks a little different than what people who are used to Southwestern pottery expect. And so if the tribe could assist more in marketing our arts, I think that would be great. They are doing um, something that I'm really excited about, which is partnering with us on our art show and our fashion show to help make that bigger. Um, so I think that partnership is going to be very exciting. And I think the tribe, you know, has a desire to help the artists more. It's just trying to figure out the best way to do those types of things. Um, so hopefully this year we'll have even more publicity around the art market, thanks to some of the tribe's support. And um, also we may have a juried art market with prizes um, so that that'll inspire more artists to be able to participate and uh, make a little money as well. That certainly leads into my next question. Um, certainly, you know, with, here within the museum, I think we want to support all of our community members and our artists as well. Um, do you ever see the art market becoming something like Santa Fe or what kind of support could we offer or assist in uh, making that happen or even a uh, Cherokee holiday um, you know they have the art shows and the big markets and it's you know we are pretty isolated here in the southeast we don't have that on the as much on the east coast so I think that's our goal we're trying to dream big um, and I think that's what a lot of the artists would like um, to have a big, huge art market in their backyard. Um, like we said, we tend to try to follow what it is that the artists are, are asking for, not necessarily um, what other people, funders and everyone else is telling us they want to have. And I think the artists would love to be able to work more with artists from other tribes, um, see that kind of art, sell beside them, um, have people come into our community and make and have more opportunity to go into other communities and make um, and, and do cultural shares. Um, yeah, Tara says we're coming for Santa Fe. So um, if Tara says it, it, it will come true. So 
I think it's it's great to have that lofty <laughs> goal of, and that's for sure what we have. And just seeing, we've only been doing the art market and fashion show. I think this is our fourth year um, and, and it's grown pretty substantially in those years. So I'm optimistic that we can make it happen um, with more partners and, and all the resources that we do have available to us. We are very fortunate here and we have a lot of support and resources. So um, being able to pull all those together and take advantage of it. But um, it is important for us for it to be about the artist. Um, I know I keep saying that, but that's really primarily what we want to do. We want to support them in the best way possible. And I did think of one other thing that the artist would probably want me to say is enforcement of that ordinance that mandates what shops downtown can sell. Uh, I think that would be nice. That would be a nice gift to the artist because it would enable the shops to um, have to purchase more local artwork. So let's get someone in looking at that. And I think you also said something. Um, there is this misconception on what Cherokee art and Cherokee culture looks like. Um, you know, we have people who were coming here 50 years ago, coming here today, wondering where the teepees and the chiefs are, not really understanding that that wasn't us. Um, you know, the headdresses, they are badges of honor to be worn by the right person. They weren't something that our tribe had, but they, you, they're they sold in the shops. They're, <laughs> you know, they're perpetuated by some of these local shops. So I definitely, you know, see that as a hindrance to, to some of the progress that we've made in other areas. Um, let's see. This can this question can be sort of a free for all, so um, anyone can answer it. How do you see the people in our community preserving our traditions in modern and unique ways? Uh, how do you see our community evolving while retaining tradition? I'll talk a little bit about something that goes along with the fashion show and something that I've seen is people just wearing more Cherokee designed clothing. And I think that's something that you just notice, you know, because you're physically wearing it and you see people wearing it. But I see more and more people with shirts that have syllabary on them. You know, with the fashion show, people are able to custom design their own fabric and just being out in the community and, and seeing people take pride in that and to physically wear it and have it on display um, unapologetically is so great for me to be able to see. And people are doing that in so many creative in interesting ways with, you know, from head to toe, you know, they're custom designing shoes, they're beating cats. And, you know, as someone who appreciates that both artistically, creatively, um, and then just knowing what it does for people's, you know, confidence and self-esteem and pride and seeing that in our community, I think that's just wonderful to be able to see just going into the coffee shop and see, seeing people wearing ribbon skirts and things like that is something that I've really noticed in the past couple of years become more prevalent. I, I agree. And I, th I think there's a lot of little things people can do day in and day out. Um, and it's not necessarily showboating or showing off that you're Cherokee, but being proud that you are that. And there should be no shame to wearing anything that is traditional or expresses how you are on the inside, who you are. Um, something that I thought was really cool was a lot like Tanya's example. Um, I believe it was two years ago, um, but we had a Tina Swimmer and I believe Taryn Swimmer um, employees at, at Cherokee Central and uh, volleyball coaches. And she had took the initiative to have the volleyball girls made a ribbon skirts. And they were made with, uh, I believe, ba basket design and then maroon and gold Cherokee um colors uh you know integrated into the skirts and i saw one girl walking on the hall and i told her you know it's a beautiful skirt and then i saw another girl and then another one and they all had matching skirts and i was like whoa what's going on i said w w what's this for and they's like oh you know the volleyball coach blah, blah blah i thought it'd be cool i thought it'd be a bonding thing for us and also when we you know go to opposing schools for games or when people come here they see that you know 
we represent who we are on the court and uh, off the court as well. And proud to proud to be Cherokee. And we have some students who who are not enrolled members, but like I tell kids in, in, in the classroom there at uh, the high school that you know you, you're a brave as long as you're here in this community and a part of this school system. So you know you should be proud proud of it too. And um, you know express yourself that way as well. But just little stuff like that, I feel is really empowering. And especially to to kids, uh, younger kids who are finding their way and figuring out who they really are and how they want to express themselves. And kids in high school, that's a time where, you know, you try a lot of different things out to kind of figure out what type of person you are and what you want to do. And so that that's a great way if we can get more of that stuff into our communities for our people. Um, and I'm sure that's the ultimate goal for the artists as well. It's about expression and being proud of who they are. I'm not an artist in any way. <laughs> But uh, I do support uh, art and I, and I love it. And I have some family members who are great artists and somewhere in my DNA that that skipped me. But um, I, I just thought that was so empowering and, and awesome. And I even asked that they all gather up in front of the, the Cherokee High School um, sign in front of the high school entrance. And I took the picture and um, I, it might have been in the one feather. I'm not for sure, but I was just so proud. And just to see that they were proud and, you know, that's one small step you know, kind of reclaiming your culture, you know, in, in an everyday way. And some, some people may not see it as that big, but I think it's powerful. Um, I wanted to add too. sometimes we get questions from tribal members or artisans about some more um, historic or prehistoric Cherokee designs. And we're happy to share any type of knowledge that we have about that, if they want to incorporate it into their work, um, we're happy to help. So what are some uh, resources then that you would recommend, Miranda, and but, well, everyone really, um, you know, Hope and Tanya, what are some, and Kachi, what are some signal blah, blah, resources for like some of these symbols and these designs that you guys reference when you're, um, working or when you're helping artists come up with the designs for the fashion show or their pieces? I mean, throughout the Southeast, like the tribes that lived here had some similarities in the type of iconography that was present. Um, but, you know, we have books here at the Tipo that are People, I know we have like some COVID restrictions and stuff right now, but um, typically as long as we're masked up and social distancing, there are books available about Cherokee clothing or different types of artifacts that um, have been preserved and well documented for tribal members to look at. Like they can, um, we can photocopy the books or, you know, whatever they need. Um, because I do think there are some more unique designs that maybe haven't been explored yet. And for anyone who's familiar with our Tipo seal or logo, you know, that's a well-known design on, on a gorget that was found at a Cherokee site in Tennessee. Um, I've actually seen somebody with that tattoo before and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I think being able to incorporate um, even those that symbology and tattoos and stuff or as a tattoo artist or as someone who's getting a tattoo that they want to be culturally accurate. I feel like that is something really neat to do too. I'm not sure if that specifically answered your question, but that's just like what came to mind. Yeah, I guess when most people, um, they have a pretty good idea of what they want to design. And most of the time they're, you know, they're educating me on why it is that this piece is important to them. Um, I get a lot of people who base what they want to do based on old, old photographs of family members um, or, you know, things that have kind of stood out to them. Um, masks are very popular. Seven clans are very popular. Basket weaves, um, things that people are used to seeing a lot. So I think it would be cool to, yeah. Uh, maybe look into some new designs or at least provide that resource. So thank you, Miranda, to people who are maybe um, have some different, who want to try something different. All right, everyone. Um, we have one question here in the, let me, in the uh, Q and A section, I'm going to bring it to the screen. It looks like it's got some comments under it, but we can kind of um, bring it up and have everyone 
go through the order that we started with and then we can uh, end the session after we answer the question. Hello, I'm planning to visit Cherokee, North Carolina for the first time. Generally speaking, what recommendations and or considerations do you have for someone who didn't grow up Cherokee but looking to learn ancestral history and culture? I know Bo and Miranda both recommended the museum. I do too as an employee. <laughs> um recommend the museum um the uh koala co-op for a locally uh, made authentic cherokee um crafts they also work with vendors from the from southwest tribes and other tribes to have authentic goods from those tribes as well they would be a good resource to or a good place to visit yeah, I think there's a, a lot of good um, written resources, too. Um, I know when, when I'm going to visit anywhere new or I, I like to research the area, but also try to research the history. And um, there's been a lot of books written about Cherokee people and not always written by Cherokee people, but written about us. But there's some good uh, resources in, in James Mooney's um, book, John Finger uh, from UT. Um, and a lot of those are at the museum, uh, at local bookstores like Talking Leaves. And kind of, I, I always encourage people to do research yourself, and but to be uh, cognizant of, of what's out there because I show my kids a lot of videos on YouTube about Cherokee language. A lot of them are done by Cherokee Nation. They producing a lot of great stuff um, with uh, OCO TV as well. And they've even come out here to the Eastern Band and featured some of our artists and and um worked with well with Bo even had it had an episode on there I saw that which was great it was just awesome I thought it was the coolest thing ever seeing our people uh being featured and they're doing a great job with that out there at Cherokee Nation but um also just be aware of some of the things that uh we talked about with um authentic auth authenticity excuse me um of, of what's out there because there's a lot of people who are um portraying themselves as Cherokee people who are who are really not and I don't know how to say it other than they're probably doing it for personal gain, but just be careful of, uh, of your source material. And, um, yeah, that's just a couple books off the top of the head, but, uh, museum ha has a great selection talking leaves as well. And, um, of course you can find most all that stuff on, on Amazon too. A lot, a lot of books, just, you know, read and, and, and fact check and double check twice and, you know, research. Uh, two books that I could uh, reference as resources, they're not necessarily for designs or for artists, but for information in general would be um, Cherokee Women by Theda Perdue. That's a generally a good one to learn about uh, gender roles and the roles of Cherokee women. Um, there's another one. I'm not necessarily sure of her ancestry, but she wrote Weaving New Worlds. This is what the cover looks like. Well, my blur thing's on. Dang. It's called Weaving New Worlds by Sarah H. Hill, and it's about southeastern Cherokee basketry. <laughs> um, and it's it was pretty insightful. It was one of the uh, textbooks assigned in college, and it's it covers a lot of different information. It also goes over gender roles and uh, very uh, in depth about how Cherokees were selling their baskets in like the 20th century before. Uh, like the Indian New Deal came into effect and put in that um, demand for uh, native goods. So it, it's a pretty cool resource to learn. Theda Purdue and Michael Green did like a good little small generalization of Cherokee people, which I think it's good. I mean, considering everything they're having to condense to put in one book. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but Theda Purdue is a good author. And if we're talking authors, I got to throw Annette Snoop Collapse out all <laughs> a link here. Um, it, her novel, Even As We Breathe, uh, it's uh, fiction, but it's a great um, portrayal of Cherokee life. And it was written by an enrolled member of this tribe. So at a bookstore near you, go buy it. I want to thank everyone for being here. And I want to thank everyone for attending. This is the end of the uh 
winter series, which focused on cultural and language preservation and revitalization. Um, the next series will focus on food sovereignty, and that is essentially the reclaiming of indigenous identity through traditional food ways. And that one will kick off on March 10th. And um, there will be more information advertised about that shortly. It's going, uh, it'll kick off with Tommy Cave and he will be talking about his position and um, his initiatives and helping the EBCI members uh, be able to harvest uh, their traditional foods and working with the park services to make sure that happened. So thank you everyone. I'm going to end the session now.